He had a personality all his own. Uh, I believe as a school teacher, I think he taught English, and he looked like a school teacher. He wore glasses, he was slight, and uh, even with an NC uniform on, he still looked like a school teacher to me. But he got to know us all, and he got to know us by our first name. And this is unusual in the Navy, calling somebody by their first name. You're usually called by your last name. And he come up to me and he said, Jack, how you doing? He used to call me Mac, that was my other nickname. And he, he was very personal. And we all got to let him walk. Uh, when we had details, and he was in charge of the details, believe it or not, in the middle of that detail, he pitched in and he was part of it. He liked to be called George, not Ensign, not Sir. And uh, he was just one of the regular guys on the ship, and we appreciated that. He showed no airs whatsoever. Uh, that's his background. Now, we had a ship, I, we talked last year about our ship in D-Day, and uh, to give you a little background, we got, we were there at D-Day at Omaha Beach. We were on the very first wave. We saw a lot of death all day. All around us was death. And that's all we saw right into the evening of that day. And uh, our crew stayed together, it was a great crew. We looked out for each other that day and many days after that. Uh, it was a small crew of 65 enlisted men and three officers. But we really looked out for each other and cared for each other. We got through that day without anybody being wounded. It was a miracle in itself how we got through it. And I told you last year, we spent 33 days there. And there could be a story each day. I'm going to tell you a story about one of those days. We were supposed to be there two weeks and then sail back to England if everything went right. Well, we were on our 13th day. We had one day to wait to go back to England. We had done what we had to do during that period of time. We had fired our guns and air raids at night. We had done what we had to do. The crew reacted great. The crew still got along tremendously. On the 13th day, we were in very close to the beach, and we hit a magnetic mine. Magnetic mine has magnets on it. It's attracted to steel, to steel hull of a ship. It came up against the rear of our ship, the stern, and blew a tremendous, it was a tremendous explosion. I know I got knocked down when we hit it. There was a tremendous explosion, and immediately the rear of our ship started to take water. We were in very close to the beach, and the stern of our ship, our engine room immediately flooded. We lost our engines. We had no power. We lost our electricity. We had no electricity. All that was back there. Our galley was flooded. All our food supplies went with it in salt water. So we were there on close to the beach, had water in the front of us. Fortunately, we had watertight compartments for the crew's quarters. The officers' quarters were also flooded. Now, we figured we're in close, they're gonna probably take us off our ship when the tide goes out. Because when the tide went out, we were high and dry there on the beach. They wouldn't allow us off the ship because the area they would have to send us still had landmines and they couldn't put us up in that area, it was too dangerous. So we had to stay aboard. We had no food, no electricity, no engines. We had nothing to eat for the rest of that day. And the next morning when the tide was out, an army truck pulled up alongside the, the ship and we hoisted up K rations. That was our food, we had K rations. They hoisted up also five gallon cans of fresh water. We had fresh water to drink only. They sent up canteens to put the water in. So that was it. We had K rations and drinking water. No other water. This went on for three days, living that way. We'd have an air raid at night. We couldn't fire our guns. We couldn't go up topside, because if we did, we were sitting duck there on the beach for any plane. So 
They kept us down below decks. We heard all the ammunition going off above us, the anti-aircraft fire. And a lot of shrapnel fell on our deck from those rounds bursting up there. After three days, our morale was at a low ebb. We were starting to pick on each other. We had squabbles. We had a fight on the ship that we had to break up. We were all, all bitter about everything, why they wouldn't let us off the ship, and we had to stay aboard. And the crew went from a good crew to an ornery crew. We were really going from bad to worse each day. Finally, George Seaton, that ensign, he noticed what was going on, and an idea went across his mind. He told our skipper, our captain of our ship, what he thought maybe could be done. Our skipper bought it, but he said, now we have to go down to the beach command that controls everything that happens on Omaha Beach. They control everything the Army does, everything the Navy does. So we had to pass that through them. So when the tide went out, George got off the ship as our executive officer, went down and talked to the beach command. He told them his idea. They knew the condition of our ship. They knew we had to stay aboard. They didn't know that our morale was at a low ebb and that we were having me mental problems. I was certainly one of those that was griping like crazy. And he came, they, for, for some reason, after he told them about our problems, they bought his idea. He came back and told the skipper, we immediately had a meeting up on the gun deck with the entire crew. We had 65 enlisted men and three officers aboard. George Seaton described what he had gained down at the headquarters there and that we could all get off the ship for three hours, three hours, while the tide was out, and that a section of the beach would be given to us where there would be no activity. It would be roped off for us to use. What were we going to use it for? We're all thinking, what would we use it for? And he said, we can use it for a softball game, a softball game on Omaha Beach. We looked at each other and said, somebody's crazy here. And so, he said, I'll look for a show of hands. Let's have a show of hands of how many want to get off the ship for an hour, uh, three hours. Trucks will pick us up and take us down to that section of the beach when the tide goes out. And all of you can get off that want to. One ensign, ensign Mullis will stay aboard. And anybody else who wants to stay aboard with him, he's volunteered to stay aboard. He looked for the show of hands. And out of 65, slowly, slowly, 55 hands went up. So we got 55 volunteers out of 65. He said, all right, we're going to have that softball game. You don't have to play. You can watch it, but you've got to stay in that area. There'll be no roaming around down there. There's going to be short patrol down there. They will make, you, make sure you stay in place. So. When the tide went out, the trucks arrived. We threw the equipment, the softball equipment, over the side of the, of the ship in bags. The guys went down on cargo net ladders, got on the beach, got in the trucks. They drove us down to that area where we're going to have this game. George Seaton brought five uh, K-ration boxes with him. He knew myself and Frank Bagola had played high school baseball. And he said, you two guys, put the bases where they belong and let's make a diamond and we'll start the game. I'll try and get volunteers to play the game. So he talked to the, the crew on the beach there. We put the bases down and we put home plate towards the water, but near, not near the water. So if anybody hit the ball, they wouldn't be hitting it into the English Channel. <clears throat> there, we started the game. It was the sloppiest game you ever wanted to play. There were more errors, mistakes, misjudged fly balls, bad throws. But all of a sudden, I heard laughter. 
I heard laughter. I heard joking around. And the crew was getting back to normal, even the guys watching the game. They were starting to needle us and, and then give us the business. We were having a great time. Army trucks stopped by. They got out of their trucks. Two Army guys joined into the game. We were having fun and we were laughing. Three hours we did that. We played probably about six innings. Each inning took forever to finish because of the sloppy play. But we, we didn't care who won or who lost. We played ball. We had fun. Everybody changed. And the trucks came back, picked us up after three hours, took us back to the ship. When we got aboard the ship, you could see the entire crew change. It went back to like it used to be. We joked around, we kidded each other, we gave each other the business, we had fun. Even the 10 that stayed aboard joined in. George Seaton that day, for the crew of that ship, brought us back to Earth and brought us back to normal. It was one of the greatest things I've ever seen any man do for a group of people. And my five fingers of the five greatest people I've ever met in my life. He's there, George Seaton, that school teacher from Oklahoma who didn't look like an Anderson and who didn't like to be called an Anderson. He saved our crew and he sure was our hero. We talked about him a great deal after that and he was just a fantastic human being. I told that story to a few people, about three people about six years ago and after I told it, they said to me, how could you play a ball game on a beach where hundreds of men died two weeks before? I thought for a minute, and I said, my answer to them was this. You know, I think every one of those men who died on that beach would have one of us to play, play that ball game. They knew what our crew went through on D-Day, what we had done since. I think they were for us to play that ball game. They said no more. That's my story about George Seaton, the school teacher, the ensign who didn't like to be called an ensign, who was a fantastic human being. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. What an honor and a privilege it is to be here today.